the wild weasel variant of the Thunderchief, the last mutation of a plane that, when first produced, was the biggest single-engine, single-seat fighter aircraft ever built. The 105 was an awesomely powerful weapon, and in the skies of Vietnam, it was to become known as the One-Man Air Force. The designer of the F-105 was Alexander Kartfeli, chief designer at Republic, and no stranger to the concept of big fighter aircraft, for he had been the designer of the World War II P-47 Thunderbolt, the biggest single-engine fighter of its day, which had been produced in large numbers and had proved itself a sturdy workhorse, not only in its intended role as an air superiority or escort fighter, but as a fighter bomber in the tactical support mission. Work on Advanced Project 63, the series of design studies that led to the 105, commenced in 1951 at the height of the Korean War, essentially as a privately funded update of Republic's F-84. The 84 had been developed as a jet thunderbolt for the escort and tactical fighter bomber roles. In Korea, it proved not up to the escort role in competition with the MiG-15, but had performed well in ground attack. The 84's straight wings were part of a very conventional overall design, and indeed the plane's latter manifestations exhibited swept wings, more appropriate to the potential speed of the jet. But with the experience of Korea to guide them, and the rapid pace of technological development to compel them, the design team soon realised that they were setting out to design a completely new plane. As the team at Republic were setting out on their project, their counterparts at the North American company had just received US Air Force support for their F-100 Super Sabre, first of the series of planes known as the Century Fighters, that were to cover the multiple fighter roles then perceived as the Air Force moved to supersonic capability. Starting life as a reworking of the successful F-86 Sabre, the F-100 was originally described as an air superiority fighter, but its latter variations added fighter bombing capabilities. With a maximum speed of 860 miles per hour, the Hun was the USAF's first supersonic fighter, and particularly in a tactical support role, was to prove valuable in Vietnam. The next plane was the McDonnell F-101 Voodoo, designed as a penetration fighter and escort fighter. The rapidity of development in aviation can be judged by the fact that, though ordered only 12 months later than the F-100, the 101 had a top speed of 1100 miles per hour. Again, the plane developed tactical capability in its latter models, and it was used extensively in Vietnam, most notably in photo reconnaissance. Third of the century fighters was the F-102 Delta Dagger from General Dynamics, an all-weather interceptor commenced in 1950. Capable of 820 miles per hour, it proved only a moderate success, but was naturally to develop to become the F-106, which had a top speed of 1,500 miles per hour. The Lockheed Starfighter, the F-104, ordered in March 1953, sought flight performance at all costs as an air superiority fighter. Basically a manned missile, the 1400 mile per hour 104 had a chequered career, but has demonstrated amazing longevity as a tactical strike and reconnaissance aircraft. At Republic, Cartvelli's team working on Advanced Project 63, after a program that ran to 108 configurations, had emerged with a design for a single engine, single seat tactical fighter bomber with the capacity to carry nuclear weapons in an internal bomb bay. This plane, the 105A, was given Air Force approval in September 1952, originally with the intention of mass production, but in the end, only two were built.
The 105, rounding out the Century fighters, was the first purpose-designed tactical strike aircraft ordered for the United States Air Force. The perception of need for such a plane derived from a combination of Korean battlefield experience, geopolitics and intra-service competition between the strategic and tactical air commands of the USAF. For TAC, the 105, in addition to opening out the parameters of their conventional role, brought with it the capability to carry nuclear weapons over a long range, with a corresponding rise in their prestige to rival that of the strategic command. The tactical air command support of the 105 was to prove vital to the project as the plane went through its difficult early years. Virtually all the technology and engineering of aircraft were being revolutionized at once in response to the myriad physical challenges inherent in the transition to the age of supersonic flight. And the F-105 was to have plenty of developmental problems in the years ahead. But what made the huge fighter so special was its large internal capacity. The atom bombs, more reminiscent of drums than weapons, gave it a potency far beyond any competitor. For the F-105A, significant breakthroughs in understanding the effects of transonic drag, together with some inherent deficiencies, had already seen the design superseded. It first flew over three years after the USAF go-ahead, and by then, its internal systems had changed beyond recognition. Also by then, manufacture of its replacement was underway. The third F-105 was the first of the B model. We see it here on the 26th of May 1956 as it taxis to its takeoff point for its first flight. This was the first 105 to have a power plant big enough to match its size and major external changes had also been incorporated, chief among which was the area ruling which had rescued the F-102 from its drag and turbulence problems. This had replaced the straight lines of the A model with a slim hip over the wing. A massive four-petaled air brake now dominated the previously clean lines of the engine exhaust, and there had also been changes made to the air intakes, giving the Thunder Chief its characteristic nostrils. A larger tail area had increased stability. These and other changes had resulted in a plane with the capacity to double the speed of sound. Perhaps symbolically, this first flight was to be beset by almost fatal problems. It was intended that the flight be short, little more than a quick circuit. But when it came time to lower the wheels, there was no response from the nose wheel. Raising and lowering the wheels had no effect. The nose wheel would not budge. Rather than abandon the plane, it was decided to attempt a wheels-up landing. And so the test pilot set the machine down on a long, dangerous slide across the salt. Eventually the plane came to a halt and emergency crews converged on the site in the slowly clearing dust. The crash was more than an intense embarrassment for a project that was already being scrutinized as excessively expensive and troubled by technical problems. However, it was still possible to argue that the problems were being solved in ways that consistently improved the overall capability of the plane and that, even as simply a test program, the 105 was revolutionizing the understanding, not only of the science of aviation, but the potentiality of tactical aircraft. The cause of the crash was soon identified in the new air intake controls, which at high thrust settings were jamming the wheel in position, a fairly simple thing to correct. One other thing that the crash demonstrated was something that those who flew the Thunder Chief in action came to know and approve of, its toughness. The plane was lifted, the undercarriage was lowered, and the prototype was towed away to be mended. 
Rebuilt, the plane rejoined the test program as work progressed on tying together all the systems and ironing out the bugs in the components. The engineers were dealing with concepts and forces they could only barely control and overcoming the snags as they appeared. It's difficult to think of any other way that these problems, theoretical and practical, could have been kept up with in the intense scramble of technical development. In being the first plane capable of both air-to-air -air fighting and air-to-ground semi-automatic weapons delivery, the plane relied on avionics packages far in advance of anything previously attempted. Among these advanced facilities were radar models for air search, contour mapping, terrain following and automatic tracking of air and ground targets even in blind conditions. Throughout its life, the 105 was to almost constantly receive new and updated facilities, but even from the first, this was a plane that was far ahead of its time. The rebuilt plane was allocated to conduct the spin testing program and a spin recovery parachute was installed on the tail of the plane. This required removing a panel to afford room for the chute and removing the air brake so that, if needed, the chute would be unimpeded. Trials on the chute demonstrated that it worked satisfactorily. The aim of spin testing is to ensure that a plane can be recovered from a spin to normal flight. That once control has been lost, it can be regained. Of course, the first thing to do in such a test is to lose control of the aircraft deliberately. Then the test pilot sits there while his plane plummets through the air for a specified duration, and then he attempts recovery. This is not work for the faint-hearted. The emergency spin recovery parachute was not needed, as the planes proved to have a natural tendency to level out after each revolution, and the pilots were able to resume control fairly easily. However, the airframe still had to be tested, and so the trials went on. Forty-seven times, the pilots let go and watched the horizon slide away sickeningly as the plane commenced its fall. If you look carefully here, you'll see a pillar of flame leap from the tail of the plane as the engine stalls. Though the flight tests proceeded well, the technical problems persisted, with the engine and the avionics still unreliable. The uncertainty of performance was matched by a wider uncertainty about the future of the plane. The original expectation of large production had been amended to 37, then cancelled altogether in December 1953. A reinstated order in February 1954 was for 15 aircraft, but by September this had been cut back to three. In October, it was back to six. Parallel to this state of flux, the operational requirements for the new fighter had already been repeatedly amended before being first published in December 1954, and by April 1955 had been changed three more times. The men conducting the test series went on with their work while uncertainty continued to shroud the future of the project. The 105's already considerable range had been augmented by the addition of external fuel tanks and these too had to be tested to establish the effect they had on the plane as well as to test the tanks themselves.
Throughout 1957, the testing went on, with the test aircraft logging many hours over the desert as the plane was slowly sorted out through multiple modifications. The pre-service evaluations, due for completion in November 1959, were to eventually go on until March 1960. One of the specifications added in 1954 was that the F-105 should be capable of in-flight refueling, another recent innovation already being widely used. With an aeroplane like the F-105, this was a tricky proposition. For the fighter pilot to slow down to the same speed as the tanker left him with insufficient airflow over the wings to maintain lift. The top speed of the tanker and the lowest speed of the 105 were very close. And as you see, the fighter becomes very hard to manoeuvre, especially in the turbulence of the larger plane, and often stalls entirely. Attempts to alleviate the problem by adding jets to the tankers, as here to a B-29, didn't help all that much. All supersonic fighters had trouble until jet tankers raised the speed of refuelling to safer levels. The tests confirmed the difficulty for the pilot of the fighter, and although successful couplings were made, the system remained largely impractical, not due to any failure of the F-105, but because of the inadequacies of the tankers. Having the drogue trail from the wingtip rather than from the tail of the plane removed the operation from the worst of the larger plane's turbulence and facilitated matters somewhat, but the tendency to stall remained. The equipment in use, the long drogue hose, did not help to make things any easier with the requirement for the pilot of the fighter to manoeuvre onto the drogue. Not until this necessity was replaced by a system where he simply holds position in relation to the tanker and the operator in the tanker directs the connection was refuelling truly a practical affair. The F-105 was equipped with two types of refuelling connector and these were to see a lot of use in the Thunder Chief's career. Back at the end of 1954, Republic must have been wondering about the fate of the 105, and their anxiety can have only been slightly alleviated by the bittersweet news they received in February 1955. 
the order was lifted back to 15, with allowance for the rest of the original 34, only if funds were available in the coming fiscal year. To add to this ambiguous news was the unsettling proviso that there'd be a fly-off against the North American company's F-107, an updated, high-powered and re-equipped Super Sabre variant. The 107 has been described as the best fighter never to be bought by the USAF, and it was certainly a potent plane. With the same engine as the Thunder Chief, it was an extremely advanced and powerful design and offered comparable performance. However, in the vital TAC interest in stores, carriage and delivery, it fell behind the 105, and the contest could be seen as a bit of a non-event. Had the 107 been compared to almost any other plane at that time, it may have outperformed it. However, the 105 was a rather special opponent, and the performance of the controversial big plane was beginning to quell the doubts about its worth. The revisions of the Thunder Chief's specifications had continued in a stream of expansions of its system's capability. Constant electronic renovation proceeded throughout the plane's development and its operational lifetime, continuing to maintain the 105 at the forefront of performance. The plethora of design changes meant that the first 15 105s produced represented five distinct subtypes. Eventually, there were to be 19, during the testing program, of course, the revisions of the plane meant that the trials were regularly extended. The normal flight testing programs were consistently completed with little trouble, as the airframe behaved very well and had admirable flight characteristics. However, the electronics of the newly conceived and developing systems caused continuing delays, as their performance was lifted to their supposed specifications. With the benefit of hindsight, we can appreciate what a fine aircraft was evolving in the process. But at the time, eyebrows were being raised and there was considerable scepticism about the plane. On the 28th of May, 1958, Three years later than originally expected, the USAF took delivery of its first operational 105. Fittingly, it was the only one of its subtype. The Air Force fighter pilots had been disappointed to hear that their new mount was in fact a rather large bomber and had christened the plane in advance, rather disparagingly, as the lead sled, thunder thud, or plane thud. Now they got their hands on it for the first time and immediately changed their minds. The nickname stuck, and thud in particular came to mean F-105. But no longer in any derogatory sense. The big plane was to be universally popular with all those who flew them. Not only did it handle and perform as a fighter, but it packed a combination of punches that was truly awesome. could carry 14,000 pounds of a very wide range of external stores, including all normal bombs, rockets or rocket pods, cannon pods, electronic countermeasures packs, air-to-surface missiles, and sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles. But almost as the reason for its existence, the Thunder Chief also had a bomb bay. To minimize supersonic drag, the bomb bay doors retracted neatly into the plane. 
To control the ejection of the bomb, both for accuracy's sake and to ensure the bomb was clear of the aircraft, it was pushed down with a pneumatic rack. The rack was strong enough to be used as a jack to load the bay if there was no bomb trolley available. In wartime operations, however, the thuds carried very few bombs internally. Most of the time, the bomb bay was occupied by a further reserve of fuel. On the outer wing, there was provision for two stores pylons to be fitted. These could be used to carry weaponry and fuel in any desired combination or removed to allow the attachment of specialized delivery racks for other armaments, like this installation for the Sidewinder. The standard built-in armament of all Thunder Chief variants was a General Electric M61 20mm multi-barrel gun. This gun fired at 6,000 rounds per minute and could fire off the entire 1,029 shells it carried in less than 11 seconds. Air Force deliveries continued, with the 335th Tactical Air Squadron becoming the first fully equipped with the new fighter and celebrating by setting a world speed record. In 1961, the first overseas deployments were made to bases in Germany. from Europe, the summer of 1964 saw the thuds go into action for the first time. Soon they were sporting new camouflage as they were deployed in larger numbers to bases in Thailand and South Vietnam. From those bases they launched the campaigns that were to write their name into history. For the F-105, Vietnam was the right place at the right time. Even during their service life up to that time, there had been continued problems with reliability, and as recently as 1962, they had all been grounded. Though those problems had been ironed out, the plague of minor defects and a series of accidents had continued almost up to their first Vietnamese missions. But the thuds in Vietnam were to earn a completely different reputation as reliable and durable aeroplanes. They also earned a fearsome reputation as weapons. The importance of the Thunder Chief in Vietnam can be simply indicated. During the first five years of their involvement there, they flew an amazing 75% of all USAF attack missions. If the skies of Vietnam were full of bombs, it was because thuds put them there.
From March 1965, increasing numbers of airstrikes were made on North Vietnam. Predominantly directed at communications targets, the raids relied almost entirely on the F-105s. The planes would heave themselves into the air with their loads of bombs and head for a rendezvous with a tanker near the North Vietnam border. For with the level of external stores they were carrying, and the way that, increasingly, they had to fly flat out all the way across Vietnam, rather than cruising to and from the target, their range had been cut considerably, and even with full tanks, the journeys didn't leave much to spare. Then they flew on into hostile airspace. At the beginning of the war, the North Vietnamese had only limited air defences, and the earliest raids were relatively quiet. Soon, however, supplies of anti-aircraft artillery, surface-to-air missiles and MiG fighters began to multiply, and the raids were flown into the teeth of the most intense air defence system ever tested in warfare. The thuds pounded the enemy bridges and roads, truck parks and military bases, and the Vietnamese fought back ably with very formidable weapons. While the loss ratio on individual raids could not be considered critical, a process of slow attrition that was to halve their number had begun for the Thunder Chiefs. Only 833 were built, and nearly 400 were to meet their end in Vietnam. Production of the 105s had been completed in December 1964. Only 78 of the B model had been built. The majority, 610, had been F-105Ds. The D had acquired an extended nose in accommodating updated all-weather navigation systems and thus was externally markedly dissimilar to the B. The other 143 were the twin-seat F model. It had always been expected that there would be a twin-seat version of the plane, but two earlier twin-seat proposals had been dropped. The Fs were to provide the stock for the later development of the last 105, the G, the Wild Weasel. The workhorse of the bombing raids was the D. The single-seaters abounded on the bases, where the work of war went on 24 hours a day. mission, the returning pilot would confer with his crew chief about the performance of the plane and hand it over to him for service. The service record of the 105s in Vietnam was excellent. On any given day, over 90% of the thuds were ready for work. This figure was higher than the overall average within the USAF and, considering the complexity, workload and relative scarcity of the big planes, it's all the more outstanding. To keep them in the air, facilities for total maintenance of the planes were built at the bases they flew their missions from, and specialist teams were constantly available to fly in to handle specific problems. Teams of ground crew at the bases carried out the normal turnaround routines, like refueling, filling the water tank in the tail for the afterburner, rearming the plane and the other servicing required between missions, quickly and efficiently.
The body of the plane was a patchwork of hatches, allowing access to the equipment inside. The big fuselage had very little spare room inside it, but the layout was good enough to ensure that servicing was relatively straightforward. The bases were a far cry from the mud and improvisation of the Second World War. A Thunder Chief parked on Tak Lee's acres of hard stand could be serviced with relative ease. The wing point combinations for the next mission were selected and effected and the plane armed in a smooth and practiced routine. A large part of the bombs dropped on Vietnam were iron bombs of Second World War vintage. Sadly, they were of a design philosophy and era that should have been long gone. However, modern smart bombs were not to really arrive in Vietnam until the F-111s used them in the last phases of the conflict. So the 105 missions were often flown to deliver hardware that was uncontrolled in flight, often unstable in trajectory, and sometimes unreliable in effect. But with these bombs, the thuds hammered the north and in most instances destroyed their allocated targets. Right through the night, the bases were a hive of activity as the work of repairing, servicing and arming the planes went on. Another factor that makes the 90% availability of the thuds even more impressive was their toughness. They kept coming back from missions with major battle damage to repair. Thuds sustained strikes from SAMs, as well as AAA and MiG cannons, and survived. This one has actually been hit by a Sidewinder missile. Each morning, the one-man air forces waited, ready. SAF flew the first of the Rolling Thunder series of strikes. The inclusion of the reference to Thunder is fitting, as throughout its three years, Rolling Thunder was to be the almost exclusive province of the Thunder Chief. The fuller extension of the air war into the north had three purposes. First, to reduce the infiltration of the south, 
second, to give pause to the communist leadership in Hanoi, and thirdly, to bolster the morale of the southern leadership and the people of South Vietnam. As the name implies, the strikes rolled forward into the north, targets being progressively further and further over the border. And the thunder was real. The damage to the north's bridges and railways and roads exacted a great cost on the communists and hampered their war effort considerably. However, though at times apparently shaken, the Hanoi leadership did not break. The thuds flew in on their deadly missions and the Vietnamese tried, with everything the Russians and Chinese could give them, to knock them from the sky. North Vietnam was not an ideal target for a sustained bombing campaign. There was very little industrial infrastructure to damage and almost no war production. The country had an agrarian society, predominantly rural and dispersed. The few major targets in terms of docks and storage were within the exclusion zones around Hanoi and Haiphong, the two major cities. For political reasons, these areas were not bombed for most of the war, as the US consistently tried to negotiate an end to the fighting in the south. The thud pilots learned their own ways of coping with the streams of SAMs that rose at them, splitting and diving to confuse and evade the missiles. In tangles with the MiGs, the 105s came off well. They had such reserve of power that if a MiG managed to get in position to fire, they could, in most cases, simply accelerate away from them. Further, the thuds were capable of turning the tables on their attackers and really mixing it. 28 MiG-17s were downed by 105s. the bombs continued to rain down on Vietnam. Supporting the bombing was an electronics and communications network of unprecedented technical sophistication. Operations controllers directed a huge fleet of varied craft in the air, at every level from artillery spotter planes to B-52s. They dispatched rescue operations for downed pilots and coordinated the activities of tankers, bombers and fighters. coast of North Vietnam prowled the Big Eye planes, packed with sensitive radar and alert for the slightest activity from the MiG squadrons. Any appearance of the MiGs was monitored and the information relayed to the fighters in the area. The constant observation, coupled with the air superiority of the Phantoms and Thunder Chiefs, served to ensure that for large periods of the war, the Communist Air Force stayed on the ground, pragmatically accepting that they could not compete.
The controllers and their equipment directing the airstrikes were themselves part of a chain of command that stretched back from Vietnam through the Pacific headquarters in Hawaii all the way to Washington, where the targets were identified and authorized. At the very end of the chain were the thuds, setting off daily with their loads. Thousands of sorties succeeded one another, with the F-105 carrying most of the load. Whether or not one questions the strategic effect of the program, it is impossible to not acknowledge the burden that the Thunder Chiefs carried and the effectiveness with which they pursued their assignments. In June 1967, the first of the thuds to do so reached the halfway point in their theoretical 4,000-hour fatigue lifetime, to be followed soon by others. The most critical fatigue concern was the strains upon the engines. The missions that the thuds were flying were unlike anything originally envisaged. They were regularly running at full power with afterburner for extended periods of time. The stress on the power plants was enormous. The hot sections of the huge J-75 engine were particularly vulnerable to this type of treatment. Already there had been some shortages of spares. As a safeguard, the normal engine life between changes was reduced from 200 to 125 hours, and teams of mechanics worked on overhauling the engines, testing them and reinstalling them on the planes. the 388th Squadron was flying a Thunder Chief with 3,000 hours under its belt, having gone out on 500 missions, received flak damage on several occasions, and been involved in a mid-air collision earlier in the year. By October, three more had passed the mark. They were growing old fast. An earlier suggestion to reopen the lines and build more F-105s had been considered, then dropped. There was a replacement for much of their work already available in the Phantom, and construction was proceeding apace on their successor, a design that had been much influenced by the story of the Thud, and which reflected many of the lessons learnt in its combat life, the F-111. For the time being, the Thuds remained indispensable, and they were constantly tended to maintain their status and prolong their life. The thuds remained in Vietnam to the end. Not only the two-seater SAM suppressing wild weasels, but also the Ds and Fs with their bombs, tactical support and electronic countermeasures systems. The thuds were still workhorses, right through to the devastating linebacker one and two operations that finally brought the North to a negotiating position that allowed the US to withdraw from the conflict. Their bombing had sustained the air war against North Vietnam. There was no other plane at the time that could have done the job. The bombing was fiercely pressed home and the results devastating, particularly when they were directed against a specific industrial target, as here on this truck maintenance depot. 
The Ho Chi Minh Trail buzzed with activity during the bombing halts, with trucks bumper to bumper, illustrating two points, the wily resolve of the Vietnamese in pursuit of their aims and the effectiveness of the bombing. With buds about, the trucks were far more circumspect. The pilot's tour of duty was 100 missions, and the thuds saw hundreds of pilots through their tour and home again. They were men who were undoubtedly universally glad to be out of the war, glad to have done their job and survived. However, many of them were to miss their big machines, and the sensation of howling through the air in a huge metal monster at twice the speed of sound. Captain John Piawati began growing his moustache when he first arrived in Vietnam in 1967. When he finished his 100th mission, the moustache was 12 and a quarter inches long. On his 55th mission, his thud was hit by artillery over the Paul Duma Bridge near Hanoi during a bombing run. His story is typical. Not only did he hit the bridge and bring down a span, but the damaged thud brought him home to finish his tour. Some of the Wild Weasel and other specialist planes stayed with the USAF after Vietnam, but the 105s were progressively phased out and retired into the hands of the pilots of the Air Force Reserves. There were not too many of them about, and they faded rather quickly from use. The last reserve flight of an F-105 was on the 25th of May, 1983, exactly 25 years after the accident on the first flight of the F-105B. Many pilots sat in the seat of an F-105 and went through the start-up process. Many owed their lives to them. Most of them considered their plane the best in the inventory. The big fighter grew from its problem childhood, and the parameters of what an aircraft could be asked to do grew with it. In an era of multiple transitions, it is an astounding achievement that so much was got right so well in one package. There were never very many of them, and their reputation is perhaps not widespread. But if the words great plane can be ascribed to any plane, then they can certainly be ascribed to the F-105 Thunder Chief, the Thud. Thank you. 